I asked Dinesh, you know, what am I… what do you want me to talk about in this… in the context of this particular uh, meeting? And he said, try and, you know, summarize in fifteen minutes something about your experience and reflections on working with India's medical heritage, which is what I have been working with for almost the last three decades. So that's what I will then try to do, to make some small reflections about my learnings related to India's medical heritage, which of course is a very indigenous, it's a traditional knowledge heritage. I think the first thing that uh, I would like to draw your attention to is that India's medical heritage flows in two streams. This is the nature of a lot of our uh, heritage. It's not only the medical heritage, it's also perhaps in respect of agriculture, it's in respect of architecture, it's in respect of even theoretical areas like mathematics and so on and so forth that our heritage flows in two streams. One stream is what we call the Prakrit stream. You can call it the vernacular, the folk stream. And the other stream is what you might call the codified stream. We call it the Sanskrit stream. Uh, that's, that's a codified uh, stream. So that's the nature of this uh, heritage. It flows in these two streams and in both these streams it is extremely rich. In the vernacular stream or the folk stream, it is ecosystem specific, it is ethnic community specific. Uh, it uses a very large number of biological resources over 6,000 species of plants, several hundred species of animals, metals, minerals. And it's a living tradition. Um, i just give you two examples of the folk stream, the importance of the folk stream, just two examples. I mean, we have an example of a plant called Phylanthus amaris, that's what the botanists call it now, it's also was referred to as Phylanthus neruri. It's a very small herb. And this is used in several parts of India by local communities for managing hepatic disorders, Kamala as we call it. I think about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, an American Nobel Prize winner Barry Bloomberg came across this plant in southern India, observed its use by local communities. And this is the Nobel Prize winner who has discovered the virus that causes hepatitis B and C. So he said, let me have a look at this plant and see what does it do with respect to viral hepatitis B and C. And he found that indeed this plant which ordinary communities, hundreds and thousands of people use for general hepatic disorders also inhibits this virus, viral hepatitis B and C. And so that's another matter which I'm not going into. He made actually a patent claim on this plant saying natives of southern India use this for general hepatic disorders but our claim along with an Indian scientist, is for viral hepatitis B and C and of course that was the virus that he himself had discovered. If I were to go further into the story, I would be able to tell you that if you look at both the streams of knowledge in respect of this plant and its use, we would find that Certainly in the classical, whereas in the folk tradition, they only talked about its use in general hepatic disorders and what was included in general hepatic disorders could possibly also have been viral hepatitis B and C. 
But in the classical tradition, in the codified tradition, there is a kind of hepatitis that is described as Kumbh Kamla. And in this particular kind of hepatitis, the symptoms of this particular kind of hepatitis are almost 90% matching with the symptoms of viral hepatitis B and C. So you could say that Kumbh Kamla appears to be the same entity as viral hepatitis B and C, except that the logic of the cause of this viral hepatitis is ascribed here to the virus B and C, whereas in the tradition it is ascribed to a certain kind of a systemic imbalance, what we call a doshic imbalance, which causes that particular Kumbh Kamla. And it's a question to be debated by people involved with IPR issues to find out whether this patent claim was based on novelty merely because it was a claim described in a different knowledge system and whether in substance Kumbh Kamla and viral hepatitis B and C are the same, they have different etiological explanations which is quite understandable when you're dealing with different knowledge systems. But I'll pass on that particular aspect because that's not the subject of today's uh, discussion. This was just to tell you that the nature of the folk stream is very rich. It's ecosystem specific, over 6,000 species of plants. I gave you example of one plant. I'll give you another example of an outstanding practice in the folk tradition. This is regarding the use of copper vessels for you know, storing drinking water. All of us as Indians know that north, south, east, west, I mean, one of the most popular means in which we uh, store our drinking water is store it in copper vessels. Now, really, when you examine this practice, you can see that um, uh, if you look at scientific studies on what happens when you store water in copper vessels, then you can see that within you know, a few hours of storage, certainly in overnight storage, it depends on the surface of copper that is in touch with the water. But certainly in overnight storage, you completely destroy the sto contact with copper, completely destroys all forms of E. coli, salmonella, cholera, vibrio cholera, and so on and so forth. So it turns out that this traditional method of storing water in copper vessels is perhaps the world's cheapest solution for microbial purification of water. Now this is just an example to tell you about the profundity of that particular folk stream. And similarly, I can go on to tell you about the sophistication of the codified stream. I mean, the codified stream is a stream of knowledge with extremely sophisticated theoretical foundations. It explains all health and disease in terms of an extremely elegant theory which is based on three systemic functions, what we call kaf, vat, and pit. Now, if you can explain all of health and disease, whether it's a chronic metabolic disorder or whether it's a cancer or whether it's a common cold or a simple diarrhea, in terms of three functional, you know, systemic three functions, kaf, vat, pit, indeed, that's an extremely sophisticated and elegant theory. So I won't go further into this, but just to point out to you that what I have appreciated over the last three decades is the sophistication of this other stream, the, the, the Sanskrit stream. And incidentally, the word Prakrit and Sanskrit, you know, etymologically are related to the word Prakriti and Samskriti. Prakriti, that Kriti that has been going on from, from time immemorial, Prakriti, Samskriti. When on Prakriti you do Samskar, modification, reflection, generalization, you get Samskriti. There is no Samskriti without Prakriti. Prakriti goes on, heedless of Samskriti. Now, I believe I come to the second part that was just to give you a glimpse of the two streams of India's medical heritage, I come now to the second part of, it's 15 minutes time, the second part of what I want to say. I believe that indigenous knowledge systems 
today provide the biggest and perhaps one of the most important sources for innovation. Why do I say so? I, I believe that the central problem of sustainability and development today in modern society is the imbalances of various kinds that are being caused by the application of Western cultural intellectual traditions, Western knowledge systems, modern knowledge systems, mainstream knowledge systems. The central problem is various kinds of imbalances and I'm sure you've had around this table discussion about it in the last two days and there's enough that is written about this. Now the reason for the imbalances to my mind is because of the particular limited, skewed, reductionist framework of modern knowledge systems. That we look at the whole of nature and the whole of the world in a partial, reduced, fragmented way. Now, of course, that, 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 that is a reality there. There is a fragmented reality. There is a reduced reality. There is a partial reality. And it is real. But it is reduced, fragmented, and partial. And it is application of such kind of reduced, fragmented, partial knowledge that, to my mind, results in this enormous imbalances. And therefore, the central problem of innovation is how do you correct this imbalance? And that is why I believe that it is indigenous knowledge with its holistic framework that will provide the solution to the balance. And I come on now to the third part of what I want to share with you, that I believe that it is really the bridging between traditional knowledge and mainstream Western knowledge systems that is, a central knowledge, that is a central challenge for coming out with creative, sustainable innovations in the years and centuries, decades ahead. In simplistic language, it is the challenge of bridging the whole and the part. And Undoubtedly, the whole and the part are related. We can't say they are, unre they are unrelated. The whole is related to the part. And there is a relationship and the challenges in discovering the relationship and the problem that we must avoid is putting an equal to there. That if you equate the whole to the part, you reduce you know, the whole into the part. And that is, that, that's not acceptable. I mean, that's, that's, that's obviously a misconception. Or if you mistake the part to be the whole, then you are exaggerating. So really, the challenge is to discover this relationship between the whole and the part. And that is a very challenging relationship, because not even the sum of parts add up to make the whole. And yet, the whole and part are related. And it is a discovery of this relationship, whether you apply it to agriculture, or whether you apply it to medicine, or whether you apply it to mathematics, or whether you apply it to any field, that I believe that we can see happening a lot of innovation coming out of this relationship. And therefore, what I'm saying in this third part of my presentation is that really the solution the most important solution, the most important source for innovation is bridging in an appropriate way, in a con proper conceptual framework, traditional indigenous knowledge systems and uh, mainstream uh, uh, knowledge systems. So thank you. I think that's all that I have to say.